I would like to welcome you all here today. Um, very, very honored to be here, very pleased to have you here with us, and I'm especially pleased to be hosting this event featuring uh, Gina Hernandez, a uh, longtime staff member here at, uh, CC, um, at uh, Stanford and um, alum of Stanford and just basically an all-around important person, certainly in the Chicano Latino community. So um, I was immediately, when we thought of bringing Juan Alicia, I wanted to see if we could get Gina involved, and so we're very happy to have her involvement. One of the things that Gina brought with us, well, brought with her, was the involvement of the Institute she brought with her uh, the involvement of the Institute for the Diversity in the Arts, which is a, um, a wonderful organization that uh, really supports students in their artistic endeavors, especially making sure that we have uh, a diverse array of art and um, programming here at Stanford. So I'm very, very pleased to be able to, I, should, I guess I should say, sorry about this, uh, my name is Paula Moya. I am, <laughs> um, I am the director of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. I'm uh, really enjoying this position. It's uh, this organization means a lot to me. I've been involved with it since it started 25 years ago. Uh, it, it basically came online when I got to Stanford. So I feel like I grew up with CCSRE. Uh, so welcome. Um, I want now to introduce uh, Alon Holt, who is the director of the Institute for the Diversity in the Arts, who is the co-sponsor for this event, and is helping us to put together the uh, 17th Annual Distinguished Kiva Lecture um, events featuring the renowned Bay Area Chicana muralist Juan Alicia. So this event here is kind of a pre uh, event Kiva. It's a Kiva event, pre-event uh, lecture to sort of just remind us of the importance of muralism, the uh, importance of muralism for activism um, by Gina Hernandez. And uh, we will also have a student-facing event at El Centro on the 13th. If you are a student interested in being involved, by all means, um, we want to have you. So without further ado, I did actually have a wonderful uh, um, file for Alon, which is locked upstairs in my office upstairs. But the important thing is that Alon is the director of the Institute for Diversity and Arts. She will introduce Gina. And another really fun fact that uh, means a lot to me is that Alon has a BA in uh, the center at, from CCSRE, a CSRE BA. So without further ado, Alana, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. And we'll go yeah. forward. It means so much just to be together in this room. I feel like I haven't been in this room, which means so much to me in so long. So just to see all of us here, it's just really amazing. And to be able to welcome and to introduce someone who's been so meaningful in my life and career, Gina Hernandez. So without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, and then also to share a little bit about the partnership between Ida and CSRE. Uh, when I was a student here, actually Paula and Hazel Marcus were the chairs at that time, so it's a really beautiful full circle moment. Um, but Ida has a long history and partnership with CSRE, uh, one that we're very thankful for, from our joint concentration in identity, diversity, and aesthetics, to our work that we do collaborating and supporting our creative honors thesis in undergrad, Shibuya Education, um, and more still with classes and events just like this. So it's an honor to be in community and partnership with CSRE, and the work that's happening now and also in celebrating its, its anniversary in this moment. So uh, I'm very honored to be able to introduce someone who has been so formative in my life and career, Gina Hernandez. I call her the architect of the arts here at Stanford because she has influenced so many of our beloved programs here on campus. She began her career at Stanford as the first executive director of the Institute for Diversity in the Arts, which she held from 2001 to 2011. She is the founding director of Stanford Arts Intensive and was key to launching the creative expression ways requirement, making the arts central to a Stanford undergraduate education. She teaches courses in Latino visual and performing arts and community-based public art here in CSRE. And she is currently working on a master's in liberal arts here at Stanford University. 
Yet her work on murals on campus and their role in social justice, social justice movement building is what we will focus here today, ahead of next week's wonderful Kiva lecture with the artist Juana Alicia, who contributed so many of the murals that are so key to many of our community arts uh, spaces here on campus, from Casa Tapata to El Centro. Super excited about being able to share not only Juana Alicia's work, but how this work lives within this history of Stanford murals here on campus, of which Gina is a preeminent expert on, so, in, coll in collaboration and community. I knew you would have a response to that. <laughs> but deeply, deeply true. Um, and we'll see it here today. Uh, Gina is alum, so really taking this Stanford history of activism from the past to the present. Super excited to be uh, with all of you as we kind of walk through that history. And then after Gina's presentation, we'll have a time to be in community and question and, and conversation with each other. So I hope that you'll have some meaningful uh, responses, questions to this work, and we can get into it from there. So without further ado, please welcome Gina Hernandez. Awesome. Thank you, Alon. It is really feeling great to be here uh, among so many familiar faces that I can actually see. Um, uh, let's see. I'll try to do this without my glasses. But um, absolutely, my love and thanks go to Alon and my home at the Institute for Diversity and the Arts, uh, primarily for always uh, being there for me. And um, I have to give my deep, deep gratitude to um, to uh, to Paula Moya and CSRE for inviting me to give this talk today uh, to discuss my current work in the context of my activist past. Um, so great thanks to you, Paula, um, for dreaming up this idea to bring Juan Alicia and to the staff, Perlita, of course, but all the staff who's been so fun to work with um, and, yeah, brings us back together in, uh, you know, certainly after a pandemic, but after many, many years of, of building this, of this place for meaningful learning about um, race and ethnicity. Um, so, and I'm particularly excited to be doing this as part of the distinguished lecture, which will feature artist Juan Alicia, and I'm deeply honored to be sort of an opening, opening act for that, and the opportunity to, to hear from her next week. Um, I've been thinking a lot about what makes our community a truly diverse and vibrant one in preparation for my thoughts to share today. Uh, I've also thought a lot about uh, how on, on earth I've had such incredible opportunities to offer my varied contributions to Stanford. Of course, first as a student, and a not so quiet one to be sure, yeah. um, and so yes, that is me <laughs> in that photo, um, but also for 20 years in service of the arts at Stanford, which I achieved last fall, um, and then the burgeoning uh, Stanford Arts Initiative in the beginning of my career as at the Institute for Diversity in the Arts is where it all started. Um, with all this in mind, uh, I dedicate my talk today to my sister Margaret Hernandez. Margie, as we call her in our family, is a proud member of the class of 1970, Stanford class of 1975. She was a pioneer who helped found and build the Chicano and Latino community here at Stanford, many of its institutions that remain today uh, and cultural ones uh, uh, notably uh, a, a founding dancer and creator of the Ballet Popular Um And she created these places along with many, many of her peers a generation before mine, so to Margie. Um, but I, uh, so I'll begin my experiences today. I'm going to just talk about two works, and they're part of a larger project. Alon um, mentioned that I'm working on a master's. And the reason I decided to get a master's um, uh, was not to further my career, but to give me some mind space to be able to deal with this collection that is so important to me um, and to many of my peers, alumni peers uh, who come before me. So um, today's talk is not a full essay that's finished. It's a project that wants to be, and it's part of a much larger look at um, a larger collection. So I really look to my mentors, many of whom are friendly, familiar faces, uh, professors who can give me some good guidance, after this talk, I'll be seeking that input um, humbly from you. Um, so I'll begin. Uh, that is me. And uh, I want to share these experiences, thoughts about artistic gestures of protest that have been animating my research lately. Um, I have been working on the documentation, restoration, and research into this collection of murals at Casa Zapata, the Chicano and Latino undergraduate residence at Stanford. Uh, this cultural and academic themed dorm was founded in 1972, again, overlap my sister's time, 
and is adorned with some 20 individual large-scale paintings and murals. Uh, the paintings that exist at Casa Zapata were painted over a 30-year span, often with students working alongside professional artists to learn and develop their own artistic talents. Uh, and that's, that's remarkable and notable and, and something we care deeply about today in Ida. Um, and according to art historian Schiffer M. Goldman, in their ubiquity, these considerable numbers of images existing in any sizable enclave of Chicanos and Latinos establish a network of previously non-existent cohesion. In other words, Schiffra says it was a movement rather than simply an assembly of Mexican or Latino origin uh, descent artists uh, that happened to fall into a single space. Um, these artists have taken then a stance which celebrates race, ethnicity, and class. Um, and that's from her work on the iconography of Chicano self-determination. Um, I was able to host, through my residency pro uh, first residency in the program at IDA, the prolific artist muralist Judith F. Baca in 2006. Definite highlight of my time at IDA. And Baca worked with undergraduates to share her process and method of creating what she called sites of public memory through her murals. Um, I modeled her course and residency from what I had seen and learned about um, in those early stages about the creation of the murals at Casa Zapata. Um, I look forward to sharing more about all of the murals in this community, um, but my focus today for time and, and, and interest uh, and what it was that I was asked to share a little bit more about um, is just on two that I, I feel resonate with the topics uh, of activism and murals in particular. So I am sharing this first piece, which is a student mural um, called The Spirit of Hoover. There's a, a close up of what absolutely is activists. I might even know one or two of them. Um, and then below, and we'll look at a, a close up in a minute, minute of The Spirit of Hoover done in over 1985-86. It was a student driven mural um, with the support of then resident fellow and muralist, essayist, uh, cartoonist Jose Antonio Burciaga. Um, it is approximately 12 by 15. I'll let us get to a, a, a bigger view. Um, it is approximately 12 by 15, uh, painted on wood panels. Uh, that is currently located in the students who you know, a student currently located in the first floor hallway of the dorm. It was originally painted and located in the Stern Hall dining area but was relocated along the way to allow for other murals to be created. Um, and this method of painting on wood panels was a cheap and sturdy, non-permanent method for several of the Casa Zapata interior works in particular to be created. Um, so this piece I mentioned is created over the fall and winter of 1985-86, which was my sophomore year. And at Casa Zapata, a group of students under the Stanford workshop uh, on political and social issues, sort of a version of our student-initiated courses, um, and with the support of residential education, came together to study muralism, and with the mentorship of Jose Antonio Burciaga, create this mural. Um, it was created and intended to address the students' perceived lack of student engagement with what was going on in the world beyond Stanford, and, and, and also to kind of engage more students who were looking at some of the political and social issues going on on campus um, to pay attention and to hopefully join us. Um, this critique was generation, generated from these students who wanted to discuss the ideas uh, that the th dorm was thinking about, um, namely the struggle to divest US support from um, the South African system of apartheid at the time, uh, the U.S. interventions militarily in the civil wars in Central America in the 1980s. Um, these were the urgent issues that I was interested in while I was an undergraduate and participated in uh, the advocacy around as a member of MECHA. Uh, for those who don't, who, who don't know, it is the Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan and has been uh, over many uh, decades the umbrella organization on many, many college campuses for active. Chicano and Latino student activism. I was not part of the group in the dorm that uh, collectively designed and executed this mural, but we did organize together, and we took part in the unveiling of this work um, and the resulting firestorm that it created. And uh, the picture that I showed you at the beginning is of 
a, a rally, an unveiling rally that we had literally on the steps of Hoover Tower. Um, I think there were like five of us. So, you know, uh, movements are relative and they begin, <laughs> some, and they begin somewhere. Um, so some things to point out that are some quite <coughs> obvious in looking at this, but I think uh, a couple things to show you that are important is that the, you know, the ropes of the folks pulling down this sort of specter of death skeleton creature um, are movements. They are intended to hopefully be the Stanford students to become a part of them. And I think it comes from multiple sources, not just, um, you know, so that, so, so this, the, the Cougarans are a, a, a representation of uh, the struggle for divestment in South Africa. Um, we have a, um, you know, the Statue of Liberty uh, and her often unbalanced scales of justice. Um, and, and, and then of course, as only students can, the implication of Stanford with the dollar system <laughs> and the pennies of where the, you know, the, the, the coins coming out there. Um, and so this was um, uh, something that the students wanted to make sure uh, they could kind of jolt some awareness from their student population beyond the dorm uh, to these issues that we cared so much about. Um, and it turned out that given the central image of the Hoover Tower uh, toppling there, as a reference perhaps to the implication of Stanford, um, that the Hoover Tower took great offense to this mural. Not surprising. Um, and lambasted the student artists. Uh, Borsiaga, as their leader, I think Rez Ed got uh, some, you know, some, some residual heat, and then the entire community felt the need to come to their defense. Um, I, through my role in Mecha, penned a few of the letters to the Daily, along with many others in the activist community. There was a Students Out of Central America uh, larger coalition group. Uh, there, of course, was the Stanford, Out of, the Stanford Divestment Movement uh, for uh, Anti-Apartheid. So many of the coalition groups that we had hopes we had worked with um, in small and those kind of uh, emergent ways became stronger. The links became stronger, and that was important. So in, in effect, the discussion that the muralists had hoped for was indeed happening across campus um, and beyond. An interesting debate flares up, as we know now uh, and again, in, in regards to the relationship between Stanford and the independent Hoover Institution. Uh, recently, I think, if I'm remembering, as recently as last year among the faculty, there was some discussion about that relative tension of the relationship between the university and the Hoover Institution. Um, on matters of actually painting this piece, me, uh, I think all, all but one were, have, were new to painting. They weren't trained artists um, uh, or majors in, in, in painting. Um, I refer to a letter that was written from Jose Antonio Burciaga to the student Mike Arguello, uh, uh, you know, an acquaintance, a good acquaintance of mine, quote, John, refer referencing another of artists, John Sub Brosky, one of the residents and muralists, um, did try to change the figure in the middle, but he didn't succeed. He, he spent a whole two days, and I needed help on the rest of it. Jose goes on to talk about what the rest of it was that he contributed to. I asked him to make the figure skinnier, give it more dramatic expression, so it looks way better, um, unquote. That was from Jose Antonio Burciaga in a handwritten letter to Mike Arguello in December of 1985 as he was leaving for his winter break. Um, the letter goes on with a full update to the students who had painted the mural and reveals to me the mentorship and leadership that Jose Antonio provided these students, a care, a care and a confidence um, that occurred in, with other murals I've seen, uh, I've investigated uh, that were created at Casa Pata and other places on campus. Mike, one of the student artists, was a member of Mecha and a leader of this effort. A Nicaragüense from San Francisco, proud Nicaragüense from San Francisco, uh, Mike pro provided me with this letter uh, that I quoted from Jose Antonio Burciaga. Um, just an aside, ho uh, Mike and his wife Terry Villalobos, who's also my class in 1988, they have all three of their kids at Stanford, I think the youngest one, uh, brought, you know, paid to send three of their uh, kids to, to Stanford. I've seen them in recent years, and I think their youngest is here now. Um, that's just amazing to me. And my group, uh, sorry, uh, back to the murals, but it's amazing to me uh, 
how much care and commitment he has, has made, he, of course, takes each and every one of them and gets my attention to go with to, to take them to see this mural. So it's a way, I think, of really the legacy that we have left and how, it, how it's nurtured in the future generations, even just in the awareness that, oh, my dad has a mural somewhere. He's going to drag me over there to see it. And then I can be there to give it a little bit more texture. Um, it's meaningful to me. Um, but I digress. Uh, Mike and the others who were the signatories of this piece have told me um, that the reason that they decided to center the Hoover Tower in that way and uh, along with this, you know, writhing sort of skeleton figure was not as an attack to the Hoover Institution, but rather it was um, a symbol that they thought could stand in for all of us, that, you know, students of every generation could kind of see themselves in a symbol in the towering Stanford landmark that we are so, um, you know, uh, clear about our belonging to once we become students. Um, it may not have succeeded, as Bursiaga noted in his letter, or been what they intended to attack, but it was effective in creating the conditions for a, a lively debate that spilled um, outside of the dorm, across campus, and, and throughout the region. Um, discussions, uh, it's getting, sorry. Um, it had an impact, that's my point. <laughs> um, the archives and the articles uh, were not only written to the Daily and the Stanford Report, but the SF Chronicle, the San Jose Mercury News, which I show here, um, and other local news sources. I don't know if you can see it, but the, the San Jose Mercury News one itself is, is, shows, shows uh, student David views the mural, which has been called uh, an expression of radical anti-establishment sentiment. Um, I, think that was, I think that was a direct quote from the Hoover, the Hoover letter. Um, uh, so um, it was remarkable that the student, it's remarkable that the students in the community had, that we had something to say provoked such debate. Hoover Institution felt the need to defend itself in light of students' ideas depicted in the mural. It was a real David and Goliath story in my Mecha memories. Um, and the community ended up being in a position to defend not only the right of the students to express these ideas in the form of a painting, and it was by extension the right of Casa Zapata to exist for a site of uh, artistic and cultural expression. Again, by the time this was painted, there were you know, some 10, 12 odd murals already painted in the dorm. Um, so Mecha played a role in defending the students, the mural, and the dorm. And I'm so interested in these works precisely because they had and continue to have an impact in terms of the ability to, to, to spark a discussion that we have and need to have in our community even today. They remind us what it means for us to be here and speak up. They ask us to express vividly and openly our ideas and thus provide a means to engage others in them. Something with them, perhaps. Um, and it's sometimes not always easy or comfortable. It was not then for us, but it is the power of these and other works at Casa Zapata to share our history and our experiences and experiences in uniquely accessible ways. The photo of me at the rally in the support of the mural in the front um, is sort of the place I find my commitments even now, uh, to lifting up these murals from their relative obscurity and to invite the discussions of the efforts of students over generations to express and to create and in so doing, to find their unique place of belonging in such places at Stanford. Casa Zapata, El Centro Chicano y Latino, and Ida are such places. And I look forward to sharing more of the collection that is at Casa Zapata in my research um, with you and in the future. The second mural um, that is flash way forward uh, that I wanted to share um, is a more recently painted piece titled, Are You sure sweetheart that you want to be well um, and if you don't know it's there on the full facade of the home of the institute for diversity in the arts harmony house as it's called and it's a mural that takes its title from uh, the book by the salt eaters by tony k bambara and it is largely about the complexities of healing uh, this was created in uh, 2019 i believe uh, so very recent but it's I find it even more relevant now, given all that we've been through in the last few years. This work was painted, again, by Jess X. Snow, who was the artist, but with the conceptualization and particip participation of Ida students' community. The mural was commissioned in part 
with Stanford's Office of Sexual Assault and Relationship Abuse resource. I think it's still called the Sarah Office. And it is a visual reminder to survivors of harm of any kind, just what is involved in healing. Um, through a quarter-long series of discussions and workshops with the students, many of whom were survivors of various forms of assault themselves, this design was conceived and executed um, with uh, the artist Jess X. Um, I'm even, yeah, remembering the, the one who stood in for the, 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 um, the face that's on the left. Um, it's a beautiful reminder uh, of the process. It's, it, it, you know, I have an, another view uh, from above how it fits so beautifully in the landscape of Stanford, given its uh, edges of, of, of the West Campus towards the lake area. It's a beautiful reminder and invitation uh, to the processes provided by nature and the earth to continually breathe life, new life, into all of us, uh, especially after the instances of violence or harm. Um, it's co it, their actual quotes from the book are scattered throughout the image as well, just one of them, because wholeness is no trifling matter. Um, so these two works, along with many others on this campus, notably three created by distinguished Kiva uh, lecturer Juan Alicia, whom I hope you will join, all join us in welcoming next week, um, exist on this campus over uh, many years. Her first was in 1984, and it was in El Centro Chicano y Latino. Um, uh, the spiral word, uh, the topic of her talk next week is the third. It was created 10 years ago, and you all might have a booklet on your chair that was created in commemoration of her painting of this mural that talks a little bit more about the process. Um, and so that was a really lovely gift from CSRE in honor of the Kiva lecture this year. Um, so one in 84, one, uh, this one in 2012, and then there's one in Casa Zapata that I do uh, spend a little bit more time in my work called Mujeres de Fuego. Um, and this piece uh, looks at uh, Mujeres on fire. I mean. The impetus was to bring women together from the community to address some of the issues that they um, uh, that they were facing as, as young Latinas in the community. And one of the things that cropped up right away in the mid-80s was uh, um, race and um, the use of uh, sexualized Latina bodies in alcohol ads. Um, they kind of did some research and discovered that by and large, if you're brown, you can sell alcohol to our communities. Um, and so that's the reference in the corner here. It was a black velvet label that they kind of uh, interrogated. And then they chose some, you know, what students do tell me are like these archetypes, maybe a little stale archetypes of Chicanas and Latinas um, across other, um, uh, other avenues that we can lift up more. And so she wanted to lift those up. This is at the entrance, uh, the, the south side entrance to the dorm. So, the two murals that I speak about um, and the three by one Alicia uh, represent a long legacy of public, public murals on campus. And I'm very excited about learning more about all of them, particularly the many that are at Casa Zapata. They serve as sites of public memory in Baca's um, uh, vision, and they visualize the experiences of our students, and they are incredible contributions to public art on this campus. And so I hope you'll get a chance to come out and see more of them. And I look forward to making these works and many others uh, more visible and more critically explored in the future. And my many thanks for your attention today. And I'd love to open it up really quickly to just uh, anybody who has thoughts or uh, questions that they'd like to share in the space uh, with Gina. Uh, is why, why murals, you know? Th there's so many different forms of which art can take. And, and murals has, has, not only on this campus, but across the world, kind of been uh, a symbol of the people in so many ways, of what you described in your talk. But why murals, and, and, and what is that uh, language of art? How does that kind of propel movements forward, communities forward, those who might not be heard forward? So why murals? Um. I mean, the, 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 it was kind of the motion in the ocean when the critical mass of Chicanos and Latinos were admitted to Stanford. Um, was the, the first class 
was uh, class of 1973. And so uh, there's, you know, that, that's a, a whole important history of why and how did we find ourselves finally on the campus um, in some critical numbers. Um, but that started with the, the civil rights uh, activism and movement and changes that came about in the late 60s, um, often by, uh, you know, very violent and terrible loss of life. Um, and uh, the, the, the university hired someone who came from the, um, I'm going to forget Cecilia's title before, but it was the office of, um, uh, not the EEOC, but like the Human Rights Office in the federal government was her job prior to becoming an uh, advisor to the university on Chicano Latino affairs. Um, so that energy was there. Uh, at the early stages, and then there was a critical mass of students. Artistically, what was going on was, in our community, was murals. That was the mode in which the movement spread a lot of messages. The other form was uh, poster art. You know, uh, mo mobilizations for, for, for actual actions were beautiful um, prints made by artists. First, you know, with a, you know, small editions. Everybody needed to have one after they participated in that march or rally. Um, but for um, as Shipra uh, mentions in her writings about self-determination, uh, invisible people and the movements that we learned from muralists from Mexico um, was large-scale painting, and was uh, you know something that was going to not uh, require a lot of institutional support or buy. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting that I didn't you know I'm dealing with is the stewardship of these works are by the community itself, not as patronaged art. Um, and so murals was part of the movement. Uh, there were muralists flourishing throughout uh, the, the, the entire country, particularly the Southwest and Midwest, um, as part of their social movements. And so that's why murals. Um, and she mentions anywhere where we kind of gather, if you list the top population cities in the United States for Chicanos and Latinos, there's probably going to be a very strong uh, public art murals in, in the community um, that proliferate. Mm -hmm. So it follows that Stanford is one of those places that you know I always think is the most unlikely place for that. But we needed a place to belong. We created those institutions, and once we created places like El Centro and Zapata, the murals exist, exist, and they come with, and they tell our stories and our histories. Um, so I think that's why. Um, I also think, and, and I, I also think that, uh, I also used to think that it was because Jose Antonio Burciago was an artist and a very creative person and he invited all these very cool artists, which did happen during my time, but the artists predate that. Um, the murals at Zapata, rather, uh, predate that. So it was already there. And Jose just helped it blossom, helped bring students those opportunities, and he knew muralists. I'm sure he had something to do with the very first invitations to Wiles, yeah. Um So he made uh, you know that blossom and make it more visible. But it, there were about four or five there before, and um, and I think it's because of that. You know, it emanates from the social movements from the '60s and '70s, and then we became uh, significant numbers in the early '70s. So your sister was part of like that first class. She says she was. This is a little inside. That's wild. She says she was an experiment. If they could succeed, then I could be here. And if she's smarter than I am. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for that looping her back in. Thank you for her. Any questions or thoughts or things that you want to uplift? Uh, I think this kind of talk gives us a lot of information about how important it is to know our history at Stanford and how much uh, what we where we come from but I also think that just like like um, country museum has a lot of art from different um, races and ethnicities the mural set in Zapata should have that visibility because I think it, it is a, um, an inheritance cultural inheritance uh, for Latinos, but I think it's for the entire community. And unless we, con not convinced, but 
may may make you so public that any student with any any ethnicity inheritance recognizes that as a cultural part of his culture or her culture uh, as a Stanford student, we, we are not going to succeed as much to make it as meaningful as it is. Because what I what I don't want is to have to defend our struggle uh, as, as a community. I think it's like more as, uh, as part of uh, the United States, part of what the United States is, the diversity, social justice. And we, we're not just one culture, we're so many. And I think that if I know the paintings in um, the 16th Chapel, and I know the, the paintings here in Zapata. They, I can draw the comparison, and it, me, it becomes meaningful. Everything becomes meaningful. Because there was, I don't know where I saw a painting, a, a, a picture, a photograph. A lot of people in the Sixteen Chapel seeing everything. But here, if we don't uh, recognize the importance of those paintings as, as any, any artistic um, production, we will keep defending what is, all, doesn't have to be defended. It's, it's part of <laughs> yeah. our One of the things, that, uh, this one was a student mural. I felt like I should, I, I wanted to talk about activism right from their own, you know, from the, the students at that time. But many of the, but the impression, as since it is a student dorm, is that they are student all student works, and we have we actually have a, a good number of student works in dorms all across the campus. I think Theta Chi is another very important uh, repository for student works. But what what Five, I think seven six Alvarado, <laughs> the new folks in the oh, room. Oh, is it not that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think what I and I, I I have so much more to share of, of this coll collection. One is I start I use the word a collection. It's not a collection, capital C, that somebody paid for to give us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's our community collection. But I, there's also so many artists that created works of their own there, not the least of which Jose Antonio Burciaga and his probably his opus of his painting career is there in the dining hall. And a lot of people speak about that one. Um, and it's it, that stands for itself, as you say. It speaks for itself. But there's others that are by artists of great renown Juan Alicia being lifted up in this moment is, is, is certainly one of them, um, but there are many, many others, and I just don't think that we are aware of who those artists are. Many of them, you know, um, aging and getting in their final years, and that's some of why it's so important to me to tell those stories. Um, still working today, and the creator of Balmy Alley in San Francisco, which is a global treasure, right? When people come to San Francisco, they see that Ray Patlan has several at Casa Zapata. Ray Patlan, look him up, prolific. Um, and uh, Zarco Guerrero, um, Estelan Chavez, uh, Eduardo Pinedo, and of course, Juan Luis. So these are, and they worked with our students. That's what I think is, is, in many cases, not exclusively. There are some that are the artist's work. Um, and everything in between, right? And then the students have done their own independent ones as well. And I think that whole story, um, is, 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 is what makes these, uh, this, this project, uh, one, very expansive, but also, you're right, very, very important. It's an important treasure of excellence on this campus that we need to know more about. Anything else you want to share? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, yeah. I, the more I... We've I, talked, and I know we yeah. are... I love that you bring your students to the, to the dorm. Oh, well, they're very motivating for us to continue this type of work. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm Gina. It's always so great to hear about your work. Um, I have two questions. So you said one of the murals was on some wooden boards or planks. Um, was it going to be moved or like you said, you said it was thought of as like temporary? The second question I have is um, I know you've done some really important work on digitizing these murals. Can you talk a little bit about those efforts and what that process was like for you? Yeah, I was thinking about that this morning. Uh, the images are in great demand. Um, 
So, but your first question, I mean, I think the panels are, canvas is expensive, especially on that size. Um, and muralism, like put it on the wall, was always the impulse, right? It, it, it wasn't, you know, I'm gonna paint something and, and frame it and put it, you know, in a particular place. It was, it needs to live where we live and kind of be invisible in our public realm and in, in, our, in, our, in, in, in our daily goings about. And um, I think there was some uh, discussion about permanence and not permanence. The ones that are of the artist's hand are on facades themselves, so they're actually not only more permanent, they are the ones that need the restoration and the attention and you know that kind of thing. Um, but the wood panels were cheap and they were intended to be like, we can work on it and spread out in the lounge, but then we can move it to where we actually want to display it and we can make that decision later. Mm -hmm. uh, again, not for something that they were necessarily going to sell to a, 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 a collector or a museum, but something that they were going to find the space for in where they lived. So that's that's one. And, and the wood panels were cheap. They're also hard to maintain. I've, uh, you know, if we get to it, but some of the restoration that was done in the dining hall in 2019 showed us some of the nuances of what wood, what happens to wood. But um, they were intended to be somewhat movable. Um, and to your second question, yeah, I mean, I uh, knew that uh, with all the expansion of students, more you know, increase in numbers of students, that residential living was going to, uh, you know, be in flux, maybe evolve, God forbid, go away uh, in certain old places like Stern. Um, I I live there. Uh, Alon knows it's concrete mason. You know, it's it's not the best modern architecture. Um, and so the idea was that we need to document all of these. And when I lived there is when I realized the extent of the volume. I mean, I wasn't, I, I wasn't a resident of Casa Zapata when I was an undergraduate student. Um, I hung out there for sure, but I, I never lived there. And so when I became an RF with my family, I was like, oh, there's one there too. And basements, hallways, bedrooms, all throughout on the facades. You know, some of them are on panels, but many of them are on, literally on the walls. So um, what was I saying? So, you know, the documentation was the first thing I thought of. Should these rooms be configured or these residences be configured into some other purpose in the future? We've seen it, right? Harmony House was a house. <laughs> um, the, the, where the Sarah office lives now, are now offices, it was a residence, you know. So who knows what is what the future holds. And so the idea of getting in there, getting high res photographs was my first step. Um, I should also mention, not in the context of Casa Zapata, but Juan Alicia's first work was in El Centro Chicano, in one of the main offices. And when that was remodeled, the mural was removed um, to bring it up to all the codes and make it modern and usable for the expansion of the greater numbers of our students who are now here. So that was important remodel, but it, 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 it warranted the removal of the wall that Juan Alicia's first mural was on. Thankfully, one column still exists, and we do have high-res photos of that. So that moment also told me, get those photos, if nothing else, so that we can look at them and see and do the research that we need, if nothing else. Um, uh, so I went through, I got a, a, one of the first Presidential Diversity and Inclusion Awards that I think we still have, I hope we still have, um, to get a little bit of money, and the first thing I did was hire a photographer to go in there. And, 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 and I had just finished being an RF, so I knew the housing folks who could get me in there in the times. You know, it took several weeks, set over a long top span of time, first to uh, get the exteriors, you know, the things that are open and available to the public, Thanksgiving break, some of the hallways and basement, and then the quiet moments of winter, winter break when all the students were gone was when we could go in and get hallways and bedrooms and uh, the deeper recesses of the basement, which we, I even found one or two that I wasn't aware of in that process. Mm -hmm. So I do have good composites, you know. Uh, the, some of the photos uh, you saw, I have each one a very wide, lots of good detail and close-ups in the best resolution I could get from a very, very accomplished photog photographer uh, from San Francisco by the name of Jay Jones. Um, and they are in great demand, I must say. Anytime anybody wants to do a, an event that has Latino, these are, you know, these are that, that's what they think of. Mm -hmm. so. 
Any students here that currently live in Casa Zapata? Yes! Yes! <laughs> oh, Kevin! Oh, Kevin. Yes. <laughs> Kevin, you made it. Do you, yeah. have one? Do you have one in your room? Do I? <laughs> they are, so there are two current residential rooms, like dorm rooms, in the house itself that actually used to be lounge spaces that were then converted into rooms to create more space for folks. Because one of the major concerns of Casa Zapata is that we just have so many people who rely on us as a community space, as a place of gathering, as a place where people feel belonging, and a sense of, in of inclusive um, community that a uh, struggle every year is that we just don't have enough space for everybody who wants to live there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, oftentimes those lounges then become sitting rooms. And so there's one in the middle room on the first and second floor uh, that uh, were murals that used to be part of like common spaces. Yeah. Yeah. They were done in common spaces. And what is it, uh, you know, what is kind of the sentiment around these murals in this current moment, you know? Well, um, I, you know, just what does that feel like? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that, um, so that was actually a question I was going to ask Gina because, you know, as the years go on, uh, oftentimes with, especially when uh, things are systematized or kind of passed on to the administrative level, um, there can be a disconnect between the history and the culture of the murals from uh, students' perspectives, students' kind of narratives and own experiences, right? Especially as uh, the Latinx population on campus is transitioning from being majority Mexican to that of being non-Mexican. Uh, we have tons of Central American students now, there are tons of South American students, a uh, growing cur uh, cur student community of like Caribbean students that are now entering the Latinx space that haven't previously. And so I guess the question that I have for Gina and something that uh, we often talk about is what is a good way to have a productive restorative conversation around the murals that acknowledges both the past um, history and legacy of Chicanx students on campus while also uh, creating space and making space for kind of new narratives to uh, start creating our own art and our own kind of um, visual narratives that we want to um, evoke and talk about and celebrate as well. So what does that look like to you? Well, I, I, if it's a great question. It's absolutely why I think we want to understand why they're there, how did they get there, who are they for, uh, what do they mean, um, and that that is the trajectory of the expansion that we've made for ourselves as a community um, to continue and to continue to have the discussions about what they mean or me and maybe meant in their own time, but also where we're going as a community and what yeah. those future stories and images uh, will be. Um, so absolutely, and I think, uh, um, I think, uh, Anna, you kind of sort of mentioned it, and how I feel about it is that we, we want to know how we got here in the first place, and what are the ways in which we tell our stories. This may, again, to Alon's point, murals may or may not be what that next wants to be. Um, uh, so kind of, what is it, what was it that put them there? Is that still the form? If it is, how do we do that work collectively as a community um, and with artists? That's I think I hope came through in my in, in my um, in my remarks was that the artists who come and give of themselves and, and help guide our students to express the best uh, version of their ideas is is a unique language, and I think that is always necessary. And we're in the midst of you know, an arts initiative that Stanford has never seen. And I think that might be part of the solution to being able to bring some, you know, more walls, more uh, programs, more artists to the discussion of the important ideas of our communities. So certainly the Chicano Latino community, but all of our communities. Because I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Is there time for one more question? Um, I'm wondering in terms of the relationship between like, Muralism here on campus and and the Great Bay Area. Mm -hmm. People beyond the area, but certainly in the Bay Area, there's been a very waves of muralism and support for muralism, mm -hmm. and then and then some disconnections. And it seems like we're in a new. It, it appears that we're in a new time, a new wave of interest and support for muralism in the public spaces. But also, I've seen some museums really supporting muralist work in different ways with like fellowship things. So my question with that is like um, if you have any um, 
Any, any comment around that, the relationship between, you know, what, what, what's been happening on campus and um, maybe what division might be on campus in, in connection to these larger movements that are happening that are, of course, related to, uh, you know, the, the social just, justice issues that, that our communities are facing now. Yeah, I mean, I think all of these, it actually was the other way around. We were paying attention, at least the ones that I know a little bit about. We were paying attention to the outside world and trying to engage ourselves in that productively here. It wasn't so much like, here's our story to tell and make our mark about. It was what we're seeing in our communities elsewhere. Um, but concretely, to answer your question, I mean, the San Francisco, again, Juan Alicia is the best example, uh, is one of the best examples, but you know there are others. Ray Butlan, I mentioned, was uh, you know active in Chicago throughout the, uh, c c the Ch Latino Chicano community in uh, Pilsen in Chicago before he came to the Bay Area, and then he you know transformed with a bunch of artists, San Francisco's Mission District and beyond. Um, and uh, many others who were active muralists in their realms across the community beyond Stanford. And that was felt by us. That was like inspiring. Um, there were connections culturally. Um, uh, we would go to things and, 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 and try to invite them to come and create their art here as part of that larger mix. So I didn't really see it as, um, you know, uh, it, it, coming the other way around, like that we were creating mural movements un, unto ourselves um, in any of these generations, certainly not in the in the time that I was here, and then trying to go be a part of it. It was they were showing us the ways to be activists, to be engaged in those larger issues from you know um, from what we were seeing. Like the South African apartheid movement was you know worldwide, and so we were paying attention to that and students trying to then say something about it here in our own midst <clears throat> versus here's what we're talking about about ourselves and then trying to offer it to uh, the external movement. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, yeah, I think you're explaining like this is a dialogue, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Definitely yes. Back and forth. yes. Um, and I think, I mean, to the to the story of the spirit of Uber, I think when we got to the point of being able to have a wider discussion and some good feedback, hard feedback, um, I think our movements were better off. If it, if it was just conversation amongst ourselves about our own needs and desires here at Stanford, it's probably not impacting the, the communities that we really care the most about impacting, in my opinion. I think that why we did what we did here was to to, to, to to be a part of and contribute to um, the social movements of our day in some meaningful way. And so that we had to defend ourselves against the Hooper Institution was good practice. <laughs> it was good, hard lessons. Uh, so that's why, I, that's some of why I chose this, this particular piece uh, today. Um, well, we thank you so much, Gina, for our discussion. <laughs> Coming. I, I welcome all of your thoughts, so you know, hit me up on email or I'll stay for a few minutes and 